I just started recording it. So anybody want to give me a clue or describe to me what types of processor that they may know more or less now that it's out there or what actually it does? What, what does it do? Can they identify what it does? Hello, hello, hello. Um, I know there's two major competitors AMD and Intel, and it's kind of funny that originally they worked together and then they kind of separate out. And it basically a very fast calculator, extremely fast. Robust, right? A very uh, pretty, pretty impressive what, what you can do with, with most of these uh, processors nowadays compared to the old processors. Uh, these things are tremendous. They uh, have now the technology on them that uh, multi-threading compared to before. Uh, we didn't have any of that, that technology. We have a lot of stuff that uh, we we wish back in the day we would have. You also need to know what's the appropriate cooling method. There's uh, always a, a, the right way of, of cooling it, the proper way of installing stuff. Naming the steps of replacing and installing a a processor so that we do not do what Lazaro uh, did to that poor little, poor little processor. Hopefully, you can a thermal paste, <laughs> identify common pitfalls, and this, and obviously, given a set of uh, symptoms, we want to be able to identify common CPU problems and describe how to solve them. So, have you installed or? Is, or replace the CPU before. Also, I, I'm going to put in the chat for those that uh, didn't have a chance to look at the calendar. I'm sorry, not the calendar, the classwork. I, I'm not sure if I put it, but the textbook that we will be uh, viewing now, the information is Pages 38 through 44 and 59 through 68 is what they're saying here from the gray book. They could be slightly wrong as we've seen before. So please, this is a class workbook. Questions or doubts on the text that I just sent out about the textbook pages 38 through 44 and 59 to 68. But you could be able to uh, view in case if you want to see any information, but that's what it, what it pertains to. Well, we got about 75% uh, saying no, but I want to learn. Yes, I did it in 16. Second place, and yes, with some help. No, I'm afraid not. That's good. That's good. I like that. Nobody said that one. So, if we can have Lazaro help me out here with the first one, as you stated, the, you kind of mentioned this slide here. So, can you help me out with this slide? Yes, sir. Types and characteristics of processors. Central processing unit, CPUs. Installed on motherboards determine system uh, computing power. Two major processors, Intel and AMD. Each of these manufacturers have many different types with many different characteristics depending on the system. Okay, I did it to myself, that was pretty cute. I just muted myself and started talking. Thank God this little thing tells you you're muted at least. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Those are the two main guys that are out there. The processors are available. Uh, in, as we know already, and he explained, the central processor unit uh, it basically has an input-output unit. It has several parts, like a control unit part of it. It has an AOU for the arithmetic part that he was talking about. Got a lot of stuff. Even some nowadays, some of them have cache uh, in there, their own internal bus, because now they have, uh, like, uh, inside the, the actual system itself. So it's uh, some of them even are on the actual vi video graphic card. So, thank you. 
Which type of processes do you have in your computer? Do you guys know how to tell? I and have. Everybody two. tells me they have no idea and they have an HP, a Dell, or any other type of unit, then I think that would be silly. Because it should say it. They're usually very proud about it. And they put a little sticker there on your computer to tell you what, what you got in there. So uh, it'll be put an option for both. <laughs> Maybe. Be good. Why not? You got a dual processors in there. I don't know. I have two. Oh, I have three computers, but I only use two of them. Well, let's just name one in the computer. Yeah, and so you, you can see uh, here 75% said Intel, and that's pretty much usual. They're very, very proud about their processors because those things, they don't play around with it. They make sure that only the best come out there. They, ha they uh, even their marketing themselves are is pretty good. Has anybody ever heard or saw an AMD commercial? I have. It was weird. It was just overclocking it to the extreme on the FM plus models, I think. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, like regular on channel four or six, some channel, regular channel you have. You seen ever a commercial? Uh, the, on I, the internet ad for me. No, on the internet, yes, I've seen, but not on a regular video, TV, or, or radio. I don't think I've ever heard or seen in a, an ad for them. They're not really that much into advertising. They just say, hey, we are who we are. <laughs> but they get the job done, don't get me wrong. They're, they're cheaper processors, but they got the, the, the job done. And, and for those that can't afford the expensive uh, BMW, you can always get the cheaper models, which still do what they need to do. Okay, Intel CPUs. Alexa, if you can help me here with this slide. Intel CPU. Intel desktop, desktop and laptop processors are sold on their core P P Pentium and Celeron brands. Their very low power portable smartphone chips are branded Atom. Their high end server chips are called X Xeon. Some laptop processors are packaged in the Centrino branding, which interconnects interconnect the processor chipset and wireless adapter in one unit to improve laptop performance. Thank you. Any questions or doubts in this uh, slide? It's pretty self-explanatory. I don't think there's nothing there that just basically explaining the basics on it, nothing out of extraordinary here. Intel CPUs, we can see back in the days, Intel a four bit processor. As I stated back in the 80s, we had uh, finally a 32 bit processor. <laughs> finally, in 2009, we got the 64 bit processors. That's why you have the capabilities of being able to have Windows at 64. So if you look at the old DOS operating systems, they're four bit, and then in the 70s, you had a 60 bit operating system. That's what the operating system is referring to, is that exact um, capabilities of how, how much it can uh, process at any given moment, or any given nanosecond. Question? Okay, um, Christina, you can help us here with AMD, the advanced micro devices. Advanced micro devices, AMD, are popular in the game markets due to its advance in the integrated graphics pro processing unit. AMD uses different sockets than Intel, so the motherboard must be designed for one processor or the other. Current AMD families are FX, Phenom, Athlon, 
-hmm. and Sim Sempron for desktop, and Athlon, Turon, B-Series, Phenom, and Sempron for laptops. Thank you. So those are the names of the current families and or types of processors. We'll be digging in a little bit deeper into that. So you'll see here the uh, AMD CPUs, the desktop types, you have the gaming ones, that's Ath Ath Athlon X series. Can't even spit it out. You have the X2, as she stated a, a while ago, and the Athlon and the regular Semfron. Each one has its own unique reasons for being. Any questions on which ones are which? They're pretty self-explanatory, right? Main segment, value segment, prosumer, digital segments. So that's probably an editing one. Here's your gamer PCs. We we'll probably have that one. Same thing with 3D graphic. And this is the cheaper one. This is the one that I was talking about. This is a little Toyota. Well, actually, Toyota is kind of expensive. I don't know. Kia. <laughs> Mini. So here's the basic components on the unit itself. You have your AOUs, like I said a, a moment ago, the arithmetic logic units itself. You have your controller unit. You have the internal memory cache, your registers, and your input output that's going towards the actual, actual bus, the external. This is a visual representation of the basic components inside that square chip that you usually put down onto the motherboard. So what is the input output? What manages the data itself, instruction coming in and out. That's, as we said before, I.O. is in and out. The control unit itself manages all the activities inside. So it says, hey, you, this way, that way, you. And the next one, one or more are AOUs. They perform, sorry, they perform all of the logical comparisons and the calculations. As Lazaro said, it's a sophisticated calculator kind of chip. Registers, it has small holding areas on the chip itself to be able to hold that information instead of sending it to the memory kind of thing, if you can think about it, of what it's doing with the zeros and ones. It's got it still inside itself. Remember, usually electricity is flowing with ones and zeros going this way and that way. So those registers are holding those values are in there at that nanosecond of the moment. Holds counters, data, instructions, and A addresses. ALU is currently processing. So this guy, you could say is like an index that continuously keeps on uh, updating itself. Everybody know what an index is? So he's got a reference table, so, sim similar to what a router does, right? If somebody, anybody know what a router does and has routing tables, you could say this guy has the similar thing. He has everything, what the a a addresses that the ALU has and that is currently processing. Then it has its own internal internal memory cache that holds the data instructions waiting. So this is the guy that's here with the zeros and ones saying, hey, you finish talking to this guy? All right, here you go. That's the internal cache. That's before it gets processed, before it goes in. Buses connect to the components within the uh, processor housing. As we know, the bus, we said the bus is those little highways, usually on the motherboard, that has its own little bus routing inside. Questions, doubts? Uh, got a quick question for register. When it's holding the data as like an index, can you kind of consider that like its own version of RAM and then internal memory cache is like its disk? Well, you can consider it the same as uh, the registers on RAMs. It's the exact same thing that they're doing with RAMs. They're doing it here. Remember the ECC, the parity check, and then you have a registers memory? Yeah, so, oh, okay, I that, see it. So it's like that's that. what it is. That's exactly what it is. And then basically that's its job that it's doing in there. That registers job, the same as the other one, uh, is buffering and amplifying the si signals, right? This one's 
its job or its buffers in, in, in information, that's what it does. It, it holds uh, small holding areas on the processing chip. It basically holds the counters, the instructions, the ALU. So it, it's, it's doing something that has nothing to do with its, what a processor should be doing. This is most likely be, was before you can think of it in the old processors on the motherboard itself. So this is now inside the chip. Got it. I understand now. Thank you. Not a problem. Any other questions or doubts? All right, guys. Uh, I guess two more minutes and then we'll go to, to a break so it's easier uh, to figure out that we'll be back at 1045. All right. Factors to consider when selecting a CPU. The speed in which the processor actually operates. Because the CPU and the motherboard must work together, we also need to know what are my restrictions on this guy. So I can go and buy the uh, Pepe Mercedes-Benz that's out there. That's my impression of your current president. Sorry about that. Uh, I got to stop that. Uh, and if I buy the latest and greatest, will it work, Alexa? If I buy the latest and greatest and I got a... a, a a motherboard that's about six years old. I'll give you that much of a hint. Will that motherboard be able to work with a 2020 processor, the latest and greatest model of processor? No. Yeah, I'm pretty sure no. Not we learned also that CPUs and and uh, memory chips, all these things are usually not backwards compatible. Operating systems are something else, uh, but uh, as for physical hardware, uh, you have a very good chance that it's not backwards compatible. Because the socket itself, we're going to find out in a couple of minutes, they're, they're completely different. The multi multiple processing abilities, does it have dual processor or multi-core, multi as they say, multi-threading nowadays? And we'll get into the details of those, that information. CPUs also features, is, does it support virtualization, which we're going to need. We're going to have a homework soon uh, coming up where we need to install virtual machines. So the team leaders are going to be responsible to make sure their teams have uh, the virtual box from Oracle installed and freeware on your computers. A little foreshadowing. And they, uh, they have integrated graphics and security within them. We'll uh, hold up here, take a 15 minute break, and I'll see you guys at 1045. Yes, sir. Any questions, doubts so far before we take our break? You guys can see my screen, right? In I see it. it. All right, just making sure. Zoom here. This was the last place that we were in. So, Justin, you can help us here. To, I think we did, we covered this one, right? The this slide. We'll go to the next slide here for you. you can help us here with the clock speed a slide, please. Yes, uh, clock speed. A CPU's clock speed is its maximum maximum speed not the speed at which it must run. The CPU can run at any speed as long, as long as it doesn't exceed its clock speed. It is measured in gigahertz. Uh, clock multiplier, all modern CPUs run at some multiple of the system's clock speed. The CPU speed and multiplier are set automatically within the motherboard. Yeah, so this is the workaround that they have uh, where they have a clock multiplier and you'll see here that the bus is running at 99 megahertz while this guy is running at the core is running at 2893 and how they're doing that is with the clock multiplier here. Uh, basically, it's running at 29.0. Now, like they said, these things don't run at that speed. But they can, their maximum they, their capability is, but it's not that it's always running at that speed, because then if not, it's going to be running hot. It's like hitting your accelerator 
on your car just because it can go 160. You're not going to be running it at 160 the whole time. Make sense? If I do, it's going to burn, right? That's another reason that, uh, I'm always confused on people making a big deal about this slight little difference of the latest one. But if I have one that's just maybe a 500 less, eh, is it really worth getting a brand new PC? No, I think I could wait a couple of years. So we have here, Alexa, if you could help us with this uh, slide, please. 32-bit processors known as x86 processors can handle 32-bit in instructions from OS. 64-bit processors known as x64 processors require a 64-bit OS and can handle 32-bit applications only by stimulating 32-bit processing. Hybrid processors known as x86-64 processors can handle a 32-bit OS or a 64-bit OS. AMD process, the first one, called the AMD 64. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, my homework always for the class, and yet some, nobody's been able to, to explain this one to me. For some weird reason, the 32-bit processors are also known as the x86, yet the 64-bit processors is known as, a, as what they are, a 64x64 uh, 64 processors. Diego, uh, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt, but Carlos said that he's having some internet issues. Okay, cool. No problem. Thank you for letting me know. Thanks. So the main difference, obviously, is that the 32 can only uh, handle the OSs with 32, the 64 can only handle, handle the ones that are 64, but they can mimic or simulate a 32-bit processing. Not that they, they are doing it, they'll just make the uh, operating system feel warm and, and fuzzy. You know, nice warm and fuzzy inside. Here, this is what it's supposed to look like to you at a 32-bit at a level, but it's not, uh, it's not that it is processing at that. Hybrid processors are also known as the x86-64, as she stated, and those actually do do it. Questions, doubts? Multi-threading. Justin. Are you calling on me? Yeah, yeah, if you can help me with this slide here. Thank you. Oh, okay, sorry about that. My connection was kind of slowing down. Okay. Uh, Multi-threading. Each processor or core processes two threads or tasks at the same time. It makes one CPU act like two. Intel called this hybrid threading technology. AMD only recently in 2017 started use, uh, utilizing true multiprocessing. Yeah, they finally did it. Uh, that was one of the things that was killing them is that a lot of the commercials that came out from the Intel Pentium is uh, hyper-threading technology, hyper-threading technology, and AMD was not capable of doing that. So that basically, as it states there, each processor, depending how many core, process, uh, core it has or, or, or pretends to have, depending how it is, it, it uh, can do two or four, depending on the amount of core processors that it, it can create. So it's acting as two, four, eight processors sometime, depending on the multi-core ones that are coming out nowadays. So alluding towards multi-core or multi-processing, that's the combination of both, of multiple CPUs or cores into one single chip. Here you could see this one here has four cores or four, the quad-core processors basically have four in there. Today's multi-core CPUs are commonly dual core or quad core, even now, even six or eight core, or used to be actual four chips on the motherboard. They're all actually housed within the chip. That's how small these things are getting nowadays. Any questions on this slide? Doubts. We understand the I.O. controller down here. We understand it has cores, has a shared layer three cache. So 
alluding to maybe the question you were about to ask. Memory cache, L1, L2, L3. It's a very high speed static RAM or SRAM within the actual uh, unit itself. So no longer do I have to go and talk to you because you're so slow. I got to go to the bus, tired of the bus. So I, now I got this here, I got it on me. I don't have to talk to you. This is obviously uh, instructions that are possible from the RAM and keeps it copied there already. Each core uh, has its own L1, L2 caches. L1 is a smaller, very short access time and splits between uh, data and, and for instructions. In other words, that's what the L1D and the L1I means. L2 cache, that's a little bit bigger in capacity than the L1, relatively longer access time, so a little bit longer memory. Once again, this is cache or memory available to use so that I can be much faster. Like I kept on complaining, I'm only as, as slow as my slowest link. So if I don't give it to somebody else to do it and I can do it, it's much faster, right? That's the uh, objective. Also, the degradation of electricity or the latency of, of nanoseconds to go to my friend that's over here about two, uh, I don't know, what is that, two or three inches away or four, I don't know, I don't know how to measure very good. I'm not a carpenter, people. No, it's less than arm length when it comes to chips. So in reference to that, I have it inside me. I'm going to do it. So now I also have a, what they have in L3. And that's a, another layer of cache where all cores, so all my processors are there, have a layer of cache uh, within the actual processor package, which they actually use together to be able to go to the I.O. itself. Almost all current CPUs have the integrated memory controller, the IMC included inside the package. So no longer again do I got to go to this bus. Um, as you can see, they're trying to get rid of the bus latency. All these features that they're putting into this chip since they're able to put more and into the same size and everything's getting much smaller, it's obviously much faster than actually going out to the memory out there. It does also increase the, the, the significant in the system performance. There's no more latency compared to going out to the memory. It doesn't matter how many clock speeds anymore. It's in here. I don't got to deal with the clock. I don't have to deal with the motherboard. I don't have to do anything with the RAM. I have to, nothing to do. I don't even have to talk to the North Bridge. I can care less about the North Bridge. It's all in here. Here's a, uh, another visual representation of a quad core processor. You have your four cores here with your layer one integrated into that, into that area of the core chip. Then you have what you could pretend is a little memory chips out here for your layer two. And then you have the big layer three cache. Questions? Uh, I have a question. Um... If a chip has the integrated memory controller, does that replace the MCC, the memory controller for the RAM and CPU, or it's actually its own? You still have that to make it's sure you have communication. That's for his memory, for this this cache and stuff that he's dealing with. Memory controller, everything here that's dealing with the memory, he's doing it here. But when it comes to the external memory, uh, most machines still have that out there. After oh, right okay. after the bridge, you're talking about after the North Bridge. Because it's going to go, go straight to the north bridge, and then between the north bridge and, and the memory, there's a memory controller. Like the super okay. I.O. For, for the south bridge, from the south bridge to the other uh, very slow performing input-output peripherals, there's a super I.O. chip there that's there to deal with those slow guys <clears throat> to not slow down the south bridge. Okay, I get it. That's why it's integrated memory controller. It's actually integrated, and the MCC is related to external. Yeah, going out to the, to the external. That's to, to dealing with, with everything. That's Got it. Thank you, Diego. So what is coming in and out, you can think of it of what's coming in and out, most likely is coming through here in the, from the chip. So virtualization, that's the latest and greatest thing that's available. Anybody uh, ever use a virtual machine? I use a lot of them for school. They're very good, helpful for testing and doing a lot of things, especially for programmers who do not want to go and mess up the live environment. 
You can cr create sandbox environments to test out viruses and the inoculation of them. Also, sandbox is a virtual machine who has no access to the outside world, not even to your actual machine. It uh, virtually is stuck within itself. Uh, so these processors need to be able to do this. The old processors and motherboards were incapable of doing this. A computer basically software is now mimicking this, although there is now some hardware based ones where all they do is this. So it boots up as a, a, a what they call a type one hypervisor. And you, all you could do is really create a whole bunch of virtual machines on these things. Usually those are for, for servers. Uh, but those CPUs, if they're not able to mimic this or do this, you will have a lot of problems with, with it. It'll start crashing, going too slow. It cannot create the virtual environment as these CPUs are capable of. The integrated graphics is exactly it. A processor may include an integra uh, integrated GPU, a graphics processing unit. Basically, is the one that manipulates the graphical data, the images that are coming on to your screen. Once again, I don't need to go to the bus to go and talk to my VGA card that's all the way over there so that his GPU has to do it. I'm going to do it in here. No more latency. No excuses why these zeros and ones haven't gotten to you. Obviously, the gaming cards have their own G, uh, GPU integrated. Now, what I'm saying that, that there's not any out there, but as for a normal one to be able to facilitate the smooth actions of movements and all this stuff, they usually have this in there also. All this is to avoid the latency on that bus. I'm tired of riding the bus. Questions so far? Security, these are the next section that's available on it. Lasso, if you could read this one for us, please. All right, security. Execute disable bit is a security built into processors, referred to as XD in Intel and NX in AMD processors. It can work with the operating system to designate an area of memory for holding data or instructions. When an area is designated for data, instructions stored in this area are not executable, thus preventing a buffer overflow attack by malicious software, which attempts to run its code from an area of memory assigned to another process or its data. EDB requires a compatible operating system. It can be enabled using the BIOS or UEFI setup screen. Even though EDB can stop malware from executing, it cannot remove it. You still need to use anti-software malware to remove the malware. Thank you. So as we can see here, the EDB basically is a sophisticated processor who can see when something is not right, something that, hey, I didn't say to do that. Unless if I'm going senile and old over here, I don't remember that ever coming in here. So he'll see that weird thing. But once again, it's going to still continue. So that little electrical current is going to keep on coming with those zeros and ones. That's why they're saying you're going to still need an anti-malware to stop this. But uh, some of these uh, security features in there will stop it from actually getting to the OS kernel portion and actually executing that malware. Question. You asked me how it does it. Good luck with that. I have a weird question. <laughs> does, does AMD call it an X? Uh, yeah, it's the, the, the it, X feature is the security feature, and the XD feature is the security feature on any LT, Intel chip. Got it. I was just the question was actually, did they name it NX because of Linux? Because I know there's some functions in Linux that say NX, or is it the other way around? I don't, I can't, that I have no idea what. 
related to ARMS, when I see for Linux NX mean, I th no executable bit. That's what it means. No executable bit. The N is for no, and the X is for executable. No executable bit. And for Intel, XD is is execute disabled. That's what XD means. I, yeah, I get it now. It depends on, of course, your CPU, and Linux gives yeah. you the option which one to use. Correct. Thank you for the question. Any other questions or doubts on the, the slide? So what we call the landing grid, you could always think of it as a nice little airport where I can actually land. And the pin grid, we could always think of that bed where in somewhere in Asia, uh, they like to lie on that needle bed, which it has pins and needles. Pretty easy to know then. So the PGA tour in golf here is my pin grid, grid array. Pretty sure, hopefully you guys know what PGA tour is, but that'll help you maybe remember that's the pin grid. And my LGA is the landing grid itself. So it'll be the inverse. You'll see these pins on the actual motherboard. And this is the CPU. So when it goes in to a actual socket, it'll just land on top of it. No more guessing because it also has notches here on how it's supposed to land compared to this one here anyways. You have the, the, the one marked, right? Over here, you have notches usually, which make you put it a certain way into the hole. Also, the CPU on this one will not let you, because if you'll notice here, there is pins missing on one of these corners. So if you try to put it wrong in the other way, in the other unit, it won't allow you. Be very careful to, to actually force these things. That's why they also created this little bar on the side, socket bar to, to, the, to be able to guide and enter the actual unit. Here are all your different types of Intel sockets. This is obviously for your joy. You have your landing grid here, which is the LGA. So anything that you see here as a socket name from Intel of LGA, we know then it's that little airport where I can land on, right? It's gonna be flat chip. That's what it gotta look like. And what's wonderful and they've done with us so we don't go crazy like the memories. Can anybody tell me what's great about these names here? What else does it tell me? Not only does it tell me that, that it's a landing grid, I know exactly what it looks like, what does that 1150 represent to me? The Pin. number of pins. Yes, no more memorizing the Jesus. And I feel better now. So anyways, uh, LGA tells you what it does, or sorry, not what it does, what it is, if it's a landing grid, or PGA will be the pin one. And then the number next to it tells you exactly the amount of pins. No memorization. Then you have the processing family, the I core five, three, seven, Celerons. All that value is in here. This is for your benefit. Obviously, it's in the, if I read this, I'll probably put you guys to sleep. For that, I might as well read Mary Had a Little Lamb. Here we go, the visual representations of all the details we just saw. We have the 775s, my 1155s, 2011s, and 1150s. If you notice, they all, although they're squarish, do not look alike. This one has a square hole in the middle. This one has a rectangle in the middle. This guy has the rectangle sideways, and the other guy also. Also, there's no way you could fit one in there into the other. Any questions on the what it looks like, the sockets on the motherboard instead of the chip? This is the actual motherboard aerial view. 
your AMD sockets, sons of a, that's, yeah. Eh, sorry, that's AMD for you. FM radio. You have uh, your A10s, your A86 series. No longer do they give you that little friendly code as Intel did. You've got to know that that's the 906 holes. You have this one here, the FM, that was the FM2 Plus, not to be confused with the FM2 regular. You have used by the Trinity, 904 holes. That one's cute. We'll find the, the, the variants in this and how to find those very easily. At least visually, you'll see that it's easy, although they're very close on the amount of holes. You got your FM1 station, have AMD A4s, 6s, and so forth. 905 holes, just obviously one hole variance from one to the other. That's very frustrating. AM3 Plus, you have uh, 942, that's on the AMD FX. And then you have the threes out here, that's the Phenoms, 941s, 942. You notice they are all PGA tours. So, on my majority of the new AMD processors, the new ones are all LGA tours or landing grids. On my AMDs, the majority of them are the PGA, the pin grid. So the chip is gonna have the pin and the motherboard will have the holes. Here goes the holes. If you notice, it is it will be easy, believe it or not, I'm not sure if you can see it very well. Maybe if you have the Nearpod open in your screen, this guy has like little weird things out there and there's no hole. So here's a little thing. So that's my AM3. So if I look at this socket, forget about the amount of holes again, because that's the most ridiculous thing to know how many holes there is here. Just look at it visually. There is nothing in the middle of the chip that I should have in my hand right now. There should be no hole in the middle. And it should be missing some teeth, it looks like, in weird spots, because there's like a little thing right here where my mouse is. Do we all agree? Do you see it? There's like a little circle here. There's a little circle right about here. And there's another one right about here, some weird thing. There, but there is no rectangle hole in the middle. Hello, hello, thumbs up, yes, no, shake your head, scream, yes. Shout, knock yourself out. Come on, guys. Yes. Put me to sleep. Woo! Okay, thank you. Now, FM1 and 2, the variance is, although they look almost identical, you'll notice that these little things, just like this one here, you see this guy? You see this guy? You see this guy? You see this guy? These two touch. See it? Yet this guy over here, he's far away. Far away. He's two away here, while this guy's only one away. I know it's not much, you could say, but Diego, I know. But that's how you can tell. <laughs> Another thing that they usually do is on the little socket itself, they'll stop torturing you, and you'll notice that the socket arm, right next to the arm, the label usually is there, and they'll say FM1, FM2. They try to help you out on the motherboards because they know it's very tedious and hard to figure out since it's just small variants in your olive oil. Jordan, if you can help me out with managing the CPU heat. Most issues that arise from the CPU are related to overheating. Maintaining the CPU includes checking the heat sink, keeping the thermal pace active, and checking the system's temperature. CPU hit the heat sink mounts on top of the processor to pull heat away. Thermal paste between the two creates a thermal bond. Passive cooling is used for chipset or low power older machines. What? Passive cooling is used for chipset or low power older machines and is simple, simply a plate that draws heat away from the source. Most CPUs can be purchased with a heat sink that is designed specifically for it. I did it to myself again, huh? So uh, that's a little bit more than a dab of ther thermal paste. Uh, I think that's a uh, yeah, that's a, not too much. I mean, yeah, one thing is having, but that's maybe when they like spread a dollop. it. That's, yeah, a dollop, right? That's what they ask you to put as a dollop. And does that look like a dollop? That looks like they painted it. 
wouldn't that cause problems if you put too much? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because then it's not it's not going to transfer the heat correctly. There's a certain amount. You'll notice it. It's not. I've. That's the first. Whoa, you know what? Never mind. Rephrase it. I just noticed what it is. That's the centered little part. And so it is a dollop because here's the chip, the whole thing. So technically, yeah, it's a dollop. It's in the center. You see it? This is the whole chip, the green thing with the white thing. So it's in the center and it's not exaggerated all the way around. So I guess he considered it a dollop. I'll give him that. But I think it's a little bit too much if you ask me. It's better than putting nothing. Oh, I'm sorry, Lazaro. Sorry about that. What do you mean? No, my brain. That was my I... brain. I got to stop myself. <laughs> I, I, did, I did worse than that, okay? I, that's what I'm saying. That's why I said it's better than putting nothing. <laughs> when you said, what was it the other day? You forgot to put uh, the thermal paste and then it started overheating. Uh, it doesn't help but put a towel on top of it. But that too, that was great. That was very helpful. That's, you were keeping it warm, poor baby. You know, you want to make sure it doesn't get cold. The AC hey, was on. Hey, the AMD. It was. It was winter. I need to warm myself up. There you go. One thing is about overclocking, but I think you took it to a little bit extreme. <laughs> All right, heat sink. We when we're uh, dealing with heat sinks, we want to make sure they're secured. As we stated, and I believe Christina taught all of you guys how to finally change your uh, tires in the X pattern, we want to make sure we secure the heat sink into its location. Same thing with our po passive cooling. Sometimes they have these little doohiggies here where it latches on to the actual motherboard. Case fans, a lot of them uh, have extra case uh, fans in there to actually take out the heat. Never actually throwing air in, but if not extracting. We've got to be careful, like we said, not to blow onto these chips, because if we do, while they're expanding and getting hot, uh, that will break them. Liquid cooling systems. Looks almost like a little fish tank, huh? And uh, we have the regular ones, which uh, I stated before, those usually have a pump. So you'll see the hoses, and this one is completely in mineral oil. That, my friend, is one way to keep your system cool. Anybody ever see that one? I have. I was considering it until my friend told me the maintenance costs on that. Oh, well, <laughs> most effective reducing, but very expensive. Very, very expensive. Yeah, the maintenance on that is mineral oil. So just like your car, you're going to have to start changing the oil. You know, that uh, doesn't... Quick question. Will you need thermal paste? You just let the thing go everywhere? Is that how it works? I personally haven't had the experience of, of uh, putting one together. I can't tell you, but I know that it is it, the... the that I'm aware of, you won't even need like a heat sink or any of that stuff is unnecessary because it's completely submerged inside the mineral oil. That's pretty cool. Looks like a fish tank though. This one I have seen uh, completely in the inside. Those are all the hoses and the hoses basically pass through the, the sources that have heat. There's a radiator in there that basically uh, cools the liquid while it's, it's getting pass through certain locations, just like in a car. Steps for removing. Christina, if you could help us with this slide. Steps to remove slash install processor will vary depending on the motherboard architecture. So follow the documentation for the specific board to which you are working with. Keep the new processor in its protective bag until ready to install. Power down the system, then hold the power button for five seconds to discharge residual power. Remove the case to access the inside of the PC and use ESD safety precautions. The heat sink is removed either by clips or screws. Take extra care to unscrew using the X method. Remove the heat sink placing on an ESD bag. Note the thermal paste condition. 
Thank you. Okay, DeAndre. Step two, most CPU sockets have an arm to unlatch, which will release the CPU. Open the socket by pushing down the socket lever, lever and gently pushing it away from the socket to lift the lever. As you fully open the socket lever, the socket load plate opens. Thank you. So here goes your lever that they're talking about, and this doohiggy is your plate. This should open. Daniel. Step, sorry, uh, steps to removing and installing a CPU. When uh, removing the old CPU, take care to hold onto the edges, protecting the pins from being bent, then store inside an ESD bag. Remove the new CPU from its bag, be careful to hold it by the edges, and then look carefully at the socket to locate an indicator at which direction the CPU will sit. Some have a red slash yellow arrow slash triangle that matches up to the CPU, which may have notches that will align. Thank you. Any questions? These things should be self-explanatory. Nothing really to jump into. Teresa. If you can help us with this slide. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, lock arm when CPU is in place. Thermal paste is applied to the top of the CPU, the size of the top of a pencil eraser. If purchasing a new CPU with heat sink, check, this, check to see if thermal paste is already on the unit before applying to CPU. Now that looks like a dollop, right? <laughs> <laughs> you see that little circle that they're, that's a dollop. <laughs> the other one looked like it, they, they painted it or were about to eat and look like mayonnaise. All right, so questions, doubts, pretty simple, right? Straightforward, no. Nothing. Yeah, I just realized I made a mistake on my other computer. Yeah, you got to be careful because if we put too much, then it's not going to be able to, to it's going to be too much and it's not going to be able to go through. What about reusing it? Because that's what I did when I had to switch my heat sink. Reusing existing thermal paste that's there, as long as it's not completely dried out, it's not a problem. You can use what's there. That's not a problem at all. That's what they mean about looking at it. As long as you, you agree that it looks wet and that it's still in that sticky state and it's not in a, tr uh, a chalk state, then you should be able to use that without a problem. Next one here, um, Alexa. That's removing all like place a heat sink on top of the processor and secure the board. If required, connect the power cord from the cooler fan to the four pin CPU fan header on the motherboard near the processor. Replace the door and power on system to set. Yeah, here goes your four pin connector somewhere in the motherboard. Hopefully you noted where the fan was supposed to get connected to. That was part of our uh, picture that we should have taken, right? Mm -hmm. All right, let's hold off here before we get to that point. Can anybody explain to me what's the difference between the CPU and let's say the motherboard? If you were say a part of the body, I said that the motherboard, you could think of it as your backbone, right? That's where everything connects to the whole backbone of your body. That's the bus. We would say a part of your body, what part of your body would you say the cpu may be the cpu the cpu is like a the brain the processing part of the brain right so we can always remember that the brain the human brain has long-term memory short-term memory we can think about as that as our ram right mm -hmm. and, and our hard drive there but the calculations and the other part though i'm not a doctor can't tell you what's the parabellum or the who the hold i don't know those guys i can only tell you obviously some of them do calculations right so the mm -hmm. CPU is the part that, the, that actually helps you that to move your arm here, there, and do this. Move your eyes, interpret what your eyes are seeing. If anybody got that in school, supposedly your eyes see everything backwards in some miraculous way. You're not getting dizzy. Your brain flips it all the way around. 
So it's got a lot of jobs to do. It's not just a, a, as simple as the backbone, right? So that's why you can see that they've added a lot of features before it could only do calculations. Now they added more features. So this brain now has more job to do. It's got more capabilities. So overall, we have learned the steps and we have learned what uh, the CPU is. What would we say the, the major difference between a CPU and a RAM? How is the processor different from the RAM itself? Um, it's basically quick storage. This way, it doesn't have to wait for the disk. And um, yeah, that's really all it does. The CPU is, uh, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, you, let me rephrase it. You're stating that this, uh, for the benefit of everybody else, that the RAM is quick storage. In other words, as I move my mouse around or wherever it is here in the front, that's so that I don't have to go to the hard drive to represent this to anybody else. We agree. Yeah, like then, the syllabellum. Yeah. So the CPU, though, actually is the one that will, the moment that I'm moving my mouse, is the one that's sending back and forth and doing the calculations of everything and passing it back to the RAM. The RAM is holding what's here, but the CPU is the one that's updating the RAM as I move my mouse around and or hit buttons. Does that make sense? So the electricity is flowing through the, through the actual motherboard, goes through the CPU, gets to the RAM to then get to your actual video graphics card. But it will store that information here. Now, my hard drive, he's storing what's in the background. And that what we call that virtual memory inside itself, right? So if I go in here and I go to any other window, now I'm accessing and it threw it back into the RAM. I accessed what was in that page swap file and it threw it back into the RAM. And it's playing between the RAM and the CPU right now. They're, they're ping-ponging these zeros and ones back and forth. New child, the ghetto. Questions, thoughts? We can have uh, help here. Uh, Carlos, can you help us put the... What did, fill in the blank. did I just give you guys the answers? Yes. Here's yes. Woohoo! Thank you for the answers. All right. So fill in the blanks for us here. Which one is number one, please? All right, give me one second. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Sam, can you put the answers back in the screen? <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. I just need to take a screenshot, Carlos. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Out of all that's there, which one can somebody take a wild guess? What, what should I do first? Let's read those real quick. Should I remove the CPU yet? No. Should I look carefully at the socket? Not yet. Power down the system? Maybe. Apply thermal paste, not yet. Unlatch socket, no. lock arm, place heat sink, no, remove heat sink. So do we all agree maybe power down should be the first thing I should do and then hold the power for three to five seconds? Maybe? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So now that I helped us get started, who can help me uh, with step two? What should be the second step I should I should do? Um, remove the new CPU from its bag, being careful to hold by the edges. Okay, so I just turned off the computer and I haven't opened or done anything yet. And we're gonna take out the new chip so I can have it in my hand. No, I think remove the heat sink. Okay. Yes, I agree. Right now, and it looks like I already opened it. That They don't give me that solution. So the only thing I can do, I think, at this time, yes, I would have to agree is maybe remove the heat sink or the screws on the heat sink on the side with that X pattern thing when we're putting it back, right? But now I got my heat sink off. I can see the chip. Now that I see the chip, what should I do next? On that chip. I latch the socket arm to release the CPU. Everybody agree? That should be the third thing I should do? I agree. Okay, so now I just release the latch and the lid is open. I can, I got the hood open. I can see the motor. 
What should I do now? I say look at the indicators on the socket and at which direction CPU will sit first. The, the motor's still there. Should I take out the motor? I don't, I don't see motor. that. I don't see it should I take out the CPU or should I leave the existing yeah. CPU? Yeah, remove the new new CPU. I opened the hood, right? I took off the, I opened the latch, I opened the hood, which is that, that little lid, that's gray lid. The CPU is still there. Should I take it out? Where's the option to remove it? That would yeah, be the, the first one. First one on the top, which says remove the new remove. CPU. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there we go. So. Right. So well, now wouldn't I, it unlatch the socket arm to release the CPU? Wouldn't that be talking Okay, about yeah, yeah, yeah. So we took it out. So the CPU is in my hand. I took it out. Sorry about that. I kind of hinted what the answer is. So now remove the new CPU from its bag and be careful. So now I got it in my hands, right? So the old one's out. I took the old one out. I got nothing there. Will we agree that I, I should take out now the CPU from the bag and be prepared to do what the next one I think that Lazaro said, right? Look oh, I thought I thought it was the other way around that you want to look first, then take out the CPU, and then repeat the step. Well, the thing is, sure. that, that's what I got. The, the locator socket, I gotta look on both the CPU and on the uh, motherboard. Uh, okay, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if not, I gotta look twice. Even though if I look before, now I gotta look again at the CPU. So you do it both, aligning both of them. So I grab the CPU, I look at it. Where's one? Now I look at the motherboard, where's one? Okay, we're ready to go. So uh, we removed from the bag, that was four, and we said then five was look carefully. Now we are a stick, uh, after looking carefully at the socket and locating the indicator at which direction it should sit, what should come next? Lock I it up. Yeah, lock it in. Let me begin. So now he's in there. He's locked in, the arm's down. What should what should be the next thing I should do? I only got two things left, right? Should I, should I apply the thermal paste or place the heat sink on top of the processor? Thermal paste. You gotta apply the thermal paste first and then add the heat sink. All right. Not if you're lost at all. Yeah, lost at all likes to put the <laughs> first. <laughs> <laughs> I think he, we might be putting it on the bread <laughs> instead of on the computer. <laughs> I still have the original thermal paste. Whole thing here left. <laughs> I always got this left over. I don't know why. Uh, I, uh, I don't think we're going to let you go class with that. It'll be I'm I'm okay with that. That's why I know about thermal <laughs> paste very well. <laughs> And other things were I let my computer overheat because my liquid cooling broke and I didn't realize. And I was like, why does my computer keep crashing and dying? The pump died. That's why. That'll get hot real quick. But just imagine, just like the uh, water pumping in the car, if, if it's not pumping that water through, it's uh, going to get ugly. Yeah, I think I damaged that computer because it, it's not stable. And I think it's from me doing that prior. And it's such a good computer. I'm gonna keep you away from PCs. You're gonna be no, out. not now. I learned. I'm, I'm different. <laughs> I swear. I change. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see who we have. Uh... Pablo, if you can help me out with installation pitfalls. Okay, so we got. Installation pitfalls. Old pin grid array processor and stuck in socket. Too much force might cause some of the pins to break off inside the socket. Solution, use balance force to lift up the old processor. If a pin breaks off, use tweezers to pull the pin up. Thermal paste has used the CPU to the heat sink. Solution, keep CPU locked in the socket, a latch, or unscrew the heat sink from board. Slowly and carefully twist the heat sink to dislodge. The yeah. arm holding the land grid array CPU in the socket won't latch. The solution would be in the land grid array, there is a zip. If the arm won't go back down, be sure it is seated correctly before continuing to try. 
The ZIV doesn't apply to the ARM though, only the CPU fitting into the socket, so pushing it down to the lock sometimes takes a bit of effort. Okay, when we mean here about uh, the actual thermal paste, so it's probably too dry or something, it's fused on. So it's just usually you wanna just try to act like if you're unscrewing a bottle as, as softly as possible uh, to make that uh, heat sink dislodge itself. And the landing grid arrays, they have a little zip socket uh, that helps you, which we saw that little uh, silver thing that's in there that kind of makes it uh, actually go into place. So when you have it open, it kind of slides open. And then like when you're putting it down, it kind of slides it in, into place. Very, very subtle. It's not like a major slide or an amusement park here. Questions, doubts so far? Quick question. Is the same thing for a pin uh, array or the zip? The, the pin one has sometimes a, it doesn't have a zip, it just has a locking uh, arm. It may have oh, a, the arm, so different. the actual arm, but it won't have the actual thing as in the zip. Sometimes when you're, what they're saying is that you might just have to like push it so it like locks into place that like it kind of slides and, and snaps. It's not going to snap, but that's a lack of a better word. All right, so CPUs are rarely have uh, mechanical problems aside from perhaps um, manufacturing defect. We all agree these are things have just lines going in there. So there, there's not uh, parts like in a hard drive where there's things moving around and, and jumping around. All we got is the electricity. So if there is a defect and there's a problem in the pathway, then it's going to go. Make sense? I'm not trying to make fun of anybody or anything like that, but basically when it gets to that highway and it's trying to get through that electrical curtain, current, sorry, through that part of the chip, so just pretend that, that just like a fuse, everybody ever see the car fuses or any of those little small fuses that they got that little thing in the middle and you can pretend when it goes bad, you can see the gap in between, right? That would be a miniature gap though inside the chip. So obviously it's going to be catastrophic because there's no electricity going there. And when it is trying to use the chip there, what was expected to be on the other side is not there. So it basically, it won't work. Intermittent or random issues. Those are really, really annoying. Uh, obviously there's uh, various reasons. It could be the heat itself is malfunctioning or uh, the motherboard can't uh, maintain constant flow of power, especially if you're building yourself. You guys gotta be careful. The, the actual PSU, the power uh, supply unit itself that you're, you're you're buying, does it have enough wattage to be able to take the load? So that, that's another question. Usually these that you buy yourself have enough for the load. So if you start getting a sophisticated uh, card and you replace the actual motherboard, uh, you gotta be careful. Can it take the load? Can it do it? Catastrophic issues can cause obviously the system not even to boot. Like I said, you go, and you can't do anything. Checking the motherboard documentation for the code would be the first thing of diagnosing the issue. Usually there might be a beep code and or uh, sometimes they'll give you a code because maybe it was able to boot up and graphically it'll give you an error code. Common CPUs problems. We're gonna put you guys into uh, small groups. Well, actually six, your two groups. You guys have this here to basically review. Breakout room number one, 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 one. Welcome back, welcome back. So, team one. Yes. You guys tell me uh, from your common problem that you were given uh, for the benefit of the class uh, the common problem was? Yes. 
and we had a real world example from one of our colleagues. Some indicators is that it will go slow. Oh, sorry, can you tell us the problem, please? The problem itself? What yeah. was the, the actual problem? It's an old CPU overheating, and whenever you run an advanced program, it has issues. Thank you. So we indicated that the possibility is that it's just can't do the output and it'll throttle itself in order to stop overheating. So the indicators we, we show is that it's slowing down, it's showing graphical error if it has an integrated uh, graphic card or have some artifacting probably. Uh, you'll hear the fan go crazy, like really crazy. So that's another good sign that, well not a good sign, but a sign that your CPU is working way too hard. And you probably will hear some strange rapid noise as well. Okay. One of the obvious indicators, which one would have been maybe, maybe one of the major obvious indicators there that might happen. Now, I'm not saying it always will happen, but there might be something that says, boom. It's just shuts down completely. Right. Not, not even giving you the chance to see what has happened. Is there anything in maybe in this color tone that may happen also? Black. No, this color tone here. This one. Oh, what color? Blue tone. Well, isn't that, the, isn't that the opera system failing? Not the, the so, usually the kernel is running the C, it's, it's running within the CPU, right? So if that just kernel, died, yeah. wouldn't it go black? It would go black, but let's say if, if, if something happens and the CPU, something's going on and there's a fault, wouldn't it give you most likely a memory fault at one point? Oh, okay. So it's not a, like a complete shutdown. It's like it's some communication. So you know that it had a fault. Mm -hmm. Okay, then yeah, it will be a blue screen because the opera system would detect that and try to give you the information. Yeah, it's going to give you the code. address or that code stating what, what it was. Okay. Yeah, I use a colleague to computerize that example because that person had the, almost, the exact uh, problem of the question. Cool. Older computer overheats, running new pro uh, new things, yeah. eventually crashes. Yeah, most likely replace either CPU or the motherboard is or the whole computer, depending on your price range. Because if I replace an old CPU, one, do you think I might be able to find that processor, except for maybe an eBay? Can I find a brand new processor of a very old computer? Existing oh, old, uh, the old processor, but in new condition is what I want to make sure we, we understand. No, right? Expensive. Most likely they, those are out. And if maybe you might find it somewhere in Timbuktu, uh, it's not going to be in, in mint condition. All right. For lack of time, question. go ahead. Do they still build them if it's like a custom order? Because I know some like, because like for example, when I worked in the hotel, they had to order specific CPUs and stuff because they don't like make them anymore and it's like extremely expensive. I know that it, after stuff is end of life, I'm pretty sure in uh, if an Intel says that the chip is at end of life, then when it gets sunset, that's it. They're, they won't make anymore. Now, there might be another manufacturer out there that's making a knockoff. I don't know. I can't tell you. I don't, I don't think they would waste your time. Uh, from the facility that I saw in Costa Rica, they wouldn't be wasting their time on an old Intel chip. I'm pretty sure all these other ones that are out there are people who are buying old computers and they're refurbishing these things and uh, basically... I'm pretty sure Intel or whoever has those old computers do not mind getting money for for that. Yeah, that, that just like the old uh, the old Nintendos now that that are coming out. Those are not really old Nintendos. They make it look like an old Nintendo, but they're fitting like what, like 500 games in there. The old Nintendo wish they could could do that, right? Is that an emulation or a virtual? It's an emulator, correct. Yeah, emulator. it's an emulator, yeah. Most, most of them are emulators. 
All uh, right, so we kind of did this now, right? Uh, what is a processor and what does it do? We answered that a little while ago, right? Justin, can you answer that one for us again? What is a processor and what does it do? A uh, processor is, is similar to the brain and the computer. It pretty much is processes all the data that it gets in for programs and whatnot. So a friend tells you that they are going to order a new computer online. What would you tell them to look for in the processor so that they can be able to select it for their machine? Uh, Pablo. Um, make sure that it has um, like enough, like a, like a strong, um, like, 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 Strong speed, um, faster, faster responsive than the other ones and stuff like that. What's another thing I should tell them to look at? I know we want to get them better and greatest, but uh, uh, they're just up upgrading the CPU. What should they look at to make sure? If, what uh, CPU is compatible with this motherboard? Yeah, because yeah. if I go and buy the latest and greatest and that one's not capable of using it, then unfortunately he's going to have problems. Thank you both. For your feedback. Okie dokie, here's our little exit ticket. We have our questions here. So, here. so for number one, 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 one. We have which Intel pro uh, processor technology interconnects the processor chipset and wireless network adapter as a unit improving a laptop performance? Either Core i5 or Pentium. 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 Believe it or not, Centrino, Centrino, B, oh. Centrino. And that was because it was for laptops, right? That's that was correct for the laptops. That was the trick question. Good catch there, Jordan. Talking about Jordan, Jordan, number two. When replacing a processor, which of the following safety precautions is not, repeat, not correct? C, C. keeping the power cord connected. You don't want agree. to connect it? Why not? Wait, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stick your hand in there. See what happens. Yeah, no, definitely. That you. that one sounds like the wrong one, right? Anybody disagree? Or well, what happened here? Don't think. Tell me this thing closed on me. You guys still have it up on your your window? Yeah, I still have it. Yes. That's great. Mine just closed. So next question. Number, what are we on? Four or three? Three. 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 Christina, thank you. Uh, three. Um, I would say B, multi threading. What is the name of the processor feature that Intel calls hyper threading technology HTT? I agree. Everyone agree there? Yes. Sure, are you percent sure? Yeah. I don't know. Right. Okay, that was, uh, uh, for lack of a number, that was three? Yeah. And we said it was B, correct? Multi-threading. Yes. Okie dokie. Daniel, you can help me out here with number four. Number four, what is the most likely result of correctly installed processor but incorrectly installed cooler? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which one? I think it's B. It could be D as, wait. No, yeah, I think it's B. B, B. 
B. B as in boy? B as in boy. Yes. All right. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's going to start, but it will most likely freeze up at one point, won't it? Five. Number five. Alexa. What steps do you need to take to install a core i3 GPU into a SM2 socket? D. It is D. D. I agree. D. It's D. We mean it's D. Why would it not be compatible? <laughs> because the it's an CPU Intel itself and... is Intel and the socket is from AMD and it won't work. Yeah. yeah. So one's a landing grid and the other one's a PGA tour. So the LGA won't work on a PGA. Well, <clears throat> impossible. Even if the, uh, the had the exact amount of pins, we'll give them that maybe just to, just to play around with them. But there's no way it's going to work, even if it had exact same pin out, because one's a landing grid while the other one actually has the PGA, which is a pin. <clears throat> so there's no way you can fit that. That was more of a trick question. All right, then. For, for who? For it was a trick question. We said it was D. Okay. It doesn't matter because there's no way you can put one into a, it's like trying to put a triangle into a square peg. That it won't fit or a circle. I'm going to try to make it fit, right? All right. That's pretty much it for the morning session, guys. Any questions or doubts? <laughs>